Welcome to the Albuquerque Journal's Tech Outlook podcast. CNM is truly one college with infinite possibilities in tech and data sciences. CNM offers programs where everyone can learn about software, apps, or how to build websites. You can also choose from AI programs and machine learning, the Internet of Things, and so much more. CNM, one college, infinite possibilities, and the proud sponsor of the Tech Outlook podcasts. Hi, welcome back to Tech Outlook. I'm Ryan Botell. I'm the business editor at the Albuquerque Journal, and I'm joined here today by John Severson with the Air Force Research Lab. Um, John, can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit, a little bit about your job? Sure. Uh, my name is John Severson. I'm a engineer with the United States Air Force. I've been with the Air Force coming up on eight years here in about uh, 17 days, actually. Um, I am officially the branch chief for the Wargaming and Simulation Branch of AFRL Directed Energy. And I manage a group that's roughly about 40 people strong, nine civilians, two military, and between 20 and 30 contractors. And we test the viability of tomorrow's technology today through modeling and simulation. And we're here to talk about, um, because on Kirtland Air Force Base, the Wargaming and Advanced Research Simulation Laboratory, or WARS Lab, opened last month. Um, can you just explain to us what that is and why it's important? Sure. Um, so the, the Joint Chiefs of Staff define wargaming as a simulation by whatever means of a military operation involving two or more opposing forces using rules, data, and procedures designed to depict an actual or assumed real life situation. And so basically all that means is they get a blue team together, they get a red team together, and they simulate a uh, an engagement and basically that's what we do so we take mission level threads and we simulate engagements at, with future technology to it, test the viability of that technology whether or not it's beneficial for the Air Force to help guide acquisition dollars so you put together a blue team and a red team bl blue versus red and they basically fight each other simulating simulate a fight against each other yeah or play a game or play a game okay sure cool and we went to um the opening of the wars lab and it was um there were parts of the wars lab that were very classified like we we could go in and look but we couldn't bring our electronics we couldn't take uh pictures why is it important to keep that this facility classified um well you know it's it it's probably directly analogous to like corporate information, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, if I'm Samsung and I'm designing the new, the newest phone that's going to hit the market, I don't want it leaked because then my competitors can put out another product that can rival mine about the same time, right? Because in the industrial world, it's the first to market is usually the one that keeps the competitive edge. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, if you take that to the military, the first of the battlefield with the new technology keeps the competitive edge. I mean, it's only natural that we don't want our cutting edge military technology to get into the wrong hands or get into our adversaries' hands so that it can be adapted and used against us. Mm -hmm. And to go back, can, I mean, can you cook up just an example of what, what's a day like on blue team versus red team at the wars lab? Like what would be a scenario that you're just deploying technology to try to fix or fight or play a game? Well, you, you would basically look at um, something going on in the world today. You know, for example, sure. if you take any of the two current conflicts going on, Russia against the Ukraine or um, Israel against uh, the Palestinians, and you would basically take that one of those missions. So let's say you have, you know, a, a, a bunch of, of helicopters, if you will, that are on the Ukraine side that are trying to uh, go in and take out some military targets in Russia, that we would simulate that. And we would, the only difference is we would be using 
cutting edge technology that is off into the future and trying to prove the viability of that. Okay. And are these, um, the, you know, you talked about your team of around 40 members, are they, uh, service men and women or are they civilians or is it a mix of both? Or? So right now we have two active duty military that are on our team. And then we have, uh, nine government civilians that are on our team and the rest is primarily contracted workforce. Okay. And all of those, uh, typically have a technical spin. Right. So we have engineers, we have physicists, we have um, different varieties of engineers. We have computer engineers, electrical engineers. There might be one or two mechanical guys in there, but predominantly uh, catering towards electrical and computer engineering. OK. And it's 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 fascinating to me that this is happening right here at a lab in Albuquerque on Kirtland Air Force Base where you're simulating scenarios that are affecting millions of people across the globe. What's it like going to work at the worst lab? Uh, so back in 1990, um, I was one of those kids that went to see the lawnmower man and the lawnmower man introduced virtual reality. And I remember saying, I want to go to school. I want to do that. And that's what I want to do for my career. Mm -hmm. And 24 years later, I'm doing it. It's, it's kind of crazy. The amount of influence that film has on our lives. Mm -hmm. Like I, I saw the paper with Michael Keaton and I work at the journal today and you saw the lawnmower man. Where, where did you, can you tell me a little bit about your education? How did you end up doing what you do? So, um, I started, uh, pursuing a degree in electrical engineering. Uh, I took two years off, uh, like a lot of people do after high school because they're trying to figure out what to do with their life. And so I pursued a bachelor's degree in electrical engineering and then started working here in Albuquerque. My whole career has been here in Albuquerque and I've done a variety of things from solar power to uh, modeling and simulation to military grade data links, just a variety of things. And um, then in 2016, uh, after 15 years in the contract workforce, uh, I got picked up by uh, the United States Air Force. They came looking for somebody with my skill set. And uh, then they basically sent me to school and got me a master's in systems engineering. And that enabled me to uh, broaden my scope a lot more. And that's what got me my job today. So it's a culmination of, you know, uh, what, 15 plus eight, so 23, almost 24 years experience, plus, you know, a undergrad degree in electrical engineering and a master's degree in systems engineering is what gave me the training that I needed to do the job that I do today. Okay. And, and you're a civilian, but you work in the Air Force. Yeah. Okay. So now at the Wars Lab, um, uh, you, 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 it's all about new technologies and, and trying to harness those. Can you tell us what those, what, what are these rising technologies that you're working with in the Wars Lab? Well, it's, it's basically new applications of directed energy, right? So primarily, um, you know, directed energy can um, take the form of even something as small as a flashlight. It's mm -hmm. actually directed energy or even something as, as large as, you know, a solar panel that captures the sun rays. It's actually capturing directed energy. Um, one of the things that we do is we take that type of technology and then, of course, being in the Air Force, we bend it towards a military application. Mm -hmm. And directed, how would you simplify, can you just explain to us what directed energy is? Directed energy is uh, basically electromagnetic energy that's either composed of light or electromagnetic waves. And we tightly focus it and uh, use it for military applications. In lasers is kind of what maybe a lot of... Lasers could be one application, sure. Okay. And lasers can be used to uh, burn something. They can be used for 
uh, communications. They can be used to illuminate something. I mean, there's many applications thereof. Okay. In Albuquerque, correct me if I'm wrong, but is Albuquerque sort of a bit of a hub for directed energy? Do we have... Albuquerque is, actually. So, um, oddly enough, uh, Albuquerque has the largest uh, wooden structure in the world, and that is the uh, Atlas uh, structure, which is short for Air Force Weapons Lab Transmission Line Aircraft Simulator, right? So that's the fancy way of saying it was a uh, test bed that was developed to zap airplanes during the Cold War with an EMP. Hmm. And so a lot of that matured out of Albuquerque Right. So we we had that during the Cold War. Um, I went to UNM. There is a uh, strong push in electromagnet electromagnetics uh, from UNM. And uh, there's also New Mexico Tech, which does a lot with electromagnetics. And um, there is quite a push for directed energy. Also, currently today in uh, Air Force Research Labs, the Directed Energy Directorate solely lies in Albuquerque. The Air Force Research Lab's Directed Energy Directorate is yes. based in Albuquerque. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the Air Force, and I, I think just the military in general, has said that harnessing directed energy, who the country that's going to lead the world in directed energy, is is crucial to national security. Yeah, well, why is that? Well, um, it's. A lot of it has to do with the statement that I made earlier where, you know, first to the battlefield keeps the competitive edge. So whoever gets to the battlefield first with proven directed energy technology is going to keep that. You know, all of the TV shows that we saw with Star Trek and Star Wars with blasters and phasers and photon torpedoes, that's all directed energy. And that's where things are going. Mm -hmm. into that type of technology. When do you, when do people, uh, like I'm thinking of college students right now, how okay. do you introduce them to directed energy? What are the types of things that they're studying um, to get experience and, and be able to work in this field? Primarily to study um, electrical engineering um, is pure applications of directed energy, right? There's at least a couple of fields and waves courses that you have to take. There's, um, which are electromagnetics. Um, there's also material science courses that come into when, come into play when you start uh, designing lasers and such like that. So I would, if I was trying to guide, shall we say, an up and coming person that was really wanting to focus on directed energy, I would steer them towards, you know, like if they wanted to go engineering, I would steer them towards an electrical engineering type of degree. Um, physics, classic physics is always good. Um, you tend to have to push for a little higher level of degree uh, with physics um, because of the classical sciences, you typically have to dig a little deeper. Uh, mathematics is always great. Um, because mathematics is the language that you use to explain everything. Mm -hmm. And are those who are kind of who make up your red and blue teams that are playing games and fighting each other every day? Well, so we use we use computers to make up the teams, right? So we use um, basically computers to generate purely constructive entities, kind of like um, what you would encounter in a Halo video game. Right, the opponents that you would encounter when you play a video game, those are all computer generated. Or if you're playing chess and you're up against the computer, that's a computer generated um, constructive entity that you are going against, okay? Then there's also virtual, which has a human in the loop, and those are like your simulators. Mm -hmm. So when you see somebody at an arcade, for example, sitting down and they've got you know, a, a, a steering wheel in front of them and they're driving a virtual car, that's a virtual simulator. And it's 
probably purest layman's forms. Okay. Um, so we utilize uh, both of those types of technology, the Air Force does, we do at, at Air Force Research Labs to put together a game and play it. So for example, our, our particular mission thread might have, I don't know, let's say 200 red entities and maybe eight blue entities, and those eight blue entities are solely controlled by a computer. Hmm. And the 200 red entities are solely controlled by another computer. And then we might have four virtual entities that are interacting with the simulation that we're studying something else where we actually have a human in the loop. So you've got a simulator playing in there. Mm -hmm. In this especially when it comes to directed energy and the types of technology that you're working with on a day-to-day -day basis, what are the commercial applications for that? How could that be used to, for economic benefit? So we actually use a lot of the uh, current technology that's out there. We just bend it to military applications. Okay. Okay. So we use um, computers that have a high level of processing power okay and banks use those and uh, other engineering design firms use those to build bridges to build buildings and and do stress testing on their designs and such like that uh, we use virtual reality right um, virtual reality is making a huge impact on the gaming market and even on on um, the social market because people are climbing into the metaverse right and and doing stuff like um, living in a virtual world when they're not at work that type of thing um, we also have applications of artificial intelligence and machine learning to do some of our data analysis and as we all know uh, a lot of things are starting to go uh, that route with artificial intelligence and machine learning because it's a way to train a computer to analyze large data sets a lot faster, right? It's not just restricted to chat GPT. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So when you are at work at the wars lab and you come to some conclusion or discovery, who do you pass that information on to? So we basically pass that information on to ideally uh, other entities in the Air Force that we can influence the acquisition of the technology, basically the acquisition dollars for the technology. So uh, we get in touch with, shall we say, the platform owner if we're working with a particular aircraft um, we also get in touch with the operator, which is the warfighters. Um, we also uh, start talking to the Life Cycle Management Center for uh, sustainment and operation costs of the technology and what it takes to build it. Mm -hmm. What do you like about going to work at the Wars Lab? Oh, because um, I get to uh, fulfill a dream that started 25 years ago started when you saw a lawnmower man yeah. yeah 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 i mean you know my i when i talked to my dad and he asked you know do you have to go to work tomorrow i said yeah he says well go have fun yeah you know that's that's what i do um one of the neat things about being in engineering aside from you know it's kept me alive for 25 years right mm -hmm. Um, it's actually been fun to go to work because I've worked on a variety of, of dynamic projects, you know, all the way from, you know, in, in my previous life doing uh, utility grade solar power to taking care of seismic stations around the world to working on modeling and simulation and data links and just a variety of applications. So it's nothing's ever the same. Yeah. You know, and I get down into the nitty gritty and into the trenches. And and you can 
get so far into the trenches that you have fun going to work in a lab called the Wars Lab. Oh, yeah. Like, I, I can't yeah. think of a scarier name for a lab than Wars Lab. Yeah, it's just cool. I mean, <laughs> it's, it's, it's definitely neat. You know, I mean, you know, a lot of the thing is, is that, you know, you have to come up with an acronym that actually means something and then sounds cool. Right. And so when I came on board, uh, which I've only been in the group, leading the group for, for the last year and a half. OK, um, so that building was still a shell or almost a shell when uh, I came on board and I've seen it transform into its into its current state. Um, you know, they had to call it something. Right. So you might as well make it sound cool. Cool. And, and you did that, and why, just to kind of close out, why is the Wars Lab important to Albuquerque and America in general? Well, so one of the things that modeling and simulation does is um, it makes everything a lot more cost-effective, right? So, for example, if, if I wanted to do the same level of testing with the new technology, right? Number one, the technology would have to exist, so, right? So we're looking at trying to prove if an idea is worth pouring money to make a physical device. So the technology doesn't even exist yet, okay? So that's the first thing. So uh, the next question is, well, how much money would it cost to make that technology real? Who knows? Right. Because right now we're just trying to find out if it's even worth it. OK. The other thing um, is because the, we're the Air Force, a lot of things goes on aircraft. Right. So you've heard of the F-22 Raptor, right? Mm -hmm. One of the most expensive planes that we've made so far. One flight hour is eighty five thousand dollars. So wow. let's say we're putting together a test that takes eight hours of flight time. Yeah. That's a lot of the taxpayer's money. For right? sure. And let's say something goes wrong and we lose one. Well, now we've just tanked a billion dollar aircraft yeah. of, oh, well, yeah, sorry. You know, something went wrong in the test. It's an awful lot of explaining for something to go wrong in the test, right? Sure. So if we can take all this stuff into a computer generated environment, then we can start making better decisions to drive the technology. And you see that everywhere. You see that when they're designing Formula One cars. You see that when they're building bridges, when they're building buildings, when they're designing the next toy, when they're... Everything that we do now, pretty much everything that we interact with from an engineering standpoint has been rigorously tested in a computer environment before it ever hits the streets. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you're saving taxpayer money, advancing technology, and keeping the country safe. And mm -hmm. you get to have play games and have fun at work get while you do it. Get to have fun doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating. Yeah. Probably the coolest thing about my job is um, I'm actually a part of something bigger. Mm -hmm. It's not just me. Yeah. Well, I do thank you a lot for coming in and talking to me today. This was a really nice conversation. And, uh, it was really nice to meet you. Yeah, it was good. It's nice to meet you too, right? Thank you, John. All right.